I'm here to talk about um, a story about natural gas that we don't usually hear about, and that is the health risks that are associated with our growing reliance on natural gas. Uh, what are they? So you can break those health risks down into a couple of categories. One set of health risks comes from the emissions released by burning gas. Another set of health risks come from the actual contents of natural gas, which is itself a complex mixture, including some things that are harmful to human health. So the pollution that comes from burning natural gas has a lot of overlap with the pollution that comes from burning any fossil fuel. A lot of those things are simply a product of burning fossil fuels in our atmosphere, like nitrogen dioxide, particulate matter. So those are nothing new. But we're, by burning natural gas, we're not getting away from those pollutants. They're still being produced when we burn natural gas. And the things that are within natural gas itself um, are really unique. The, the, that mixture of chemicals is kind of unique to natural gas because of how it's produced and transported. So it depends, again, where you live. So communities that live near major gas pipelines are facing health risks from um, major pollutants like nitrogen dioxide, particulate matter, and hazardous air pollutants. But even for those of us living in the Boston area where we may not live next to one of these pipeline facilities, if we're burning gas in our homes, that gas is producing formaldehyde and nitrogen dioxide based on peer-reviewed scientific studies. And those pollutants, once they're in the home, and having a gas stove in your home and using gas in the home is also associated with um, adverse health outcomes like the risk of developing asthma or respiratory infections. One of the things that's different between uh, gas produced by conventional drilling versus fracking is the chemicals that go into the fracking process. And there are some traces of some things that come from where the gas is produced, but we don't yet know, for the gas coming to us into Boston, does it have any of those things unique to fracking? Mm -hmm. Although one thing that we will review tonight is we do know that when gas is produced by fracking, it actually results in a lot more radiation in the well compared to conventional gas wells. The conclusion I've reached is that we don't know the answer to that, and the reason is, for one thing, we don't, there hasn't been enough research done on this topic, mm -hmm. but for another, there is a tool we could use to answer that question to some degree, which is a health assessment. Mm -hmm. These uh, pipeline projects, power plants, go through incredible environmental assessments. They go through no dedicated health assessment on a routine basis. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that um, colleagues and I are trying to do is uh, develop a statewide requirement that all of um, energy facilities in Massachusetts, any new facility has to have as part of its application a health assessment. The first phase of the assessment yeah. is like an information gathering session. Mm -hmm. So uh, a team of experts is um, put together to um, develop the assessment. They collect input from the community on the health issues that the community thinks are relevant. They do their own review of the issues. And then they do an analysis of the data that they've collected. Mm -hmm. And um, using established tools, mm -hmm. develop um, the degree of risk or the anticipated degree of health impact from a particular project or even a, a particular policy. Mm -hmm. And then based on that assessment, bring that information back to the community. And there are steps all through the process for input um, from different stakeholders. And the final product could be a recommendation. Um, and that recommendation may include things like whether a facility should be located in a particular location, whether it should even be built at all, and whether there should be some form of mitigation to reduce the health risk. We are a grassroots organization of mothers and other caregivers mobilizing for a livable climate for our children. And it started about less than four years ago. 
from the beginning, we've been fighting to have no new fossil fuel infrastructure and to increase, ask people to increase efficiency and invest in renewable energy. In recent, um, many local groups, we work, each independent community organizing team has its own campaigns, then we work together on state campaigns, and now we're in a number of different states. The organization has just been mushrooming. But um, a number of communities have had gas leaks campaign, just like we had here in Arlington, where we tag the leaks that the company reports for greater awareness. It used to be thought that gas, natural gas, would be a bridge fuel, that it was much cleaner and less environmentally harmful than oil and coal. But recent studies have shown that all these leaks and the, ga and the gas leaks all everywhere from the fracking fields through the pipelines, deliberate releases at compressor stations, a tremendous amount of pure methane has been going into the atmosphere. And in a 20-year time frame, it's 86 times more potent a greenhouse warming gas than carbon dioxide. So not only in the fracking process are they really, there's tremendous destruction of the land, really harmful noxious chemicals being used which also come along with the gas and are released along with the methane but also they're poisoning water there are people in pennsylvania that can put a match to the water coming out of their faucet and it it turns on fire i think right now that if these new pipeline extensions get built, actually most of the gas won't be used here in New England. We don't really need it. It's going to be exported to Europe and Asia where they can get a higher price. So it's just people wanting to make money. But if we want a chance for a cl our climate's going to be modified. You know, we're already seeing changes. Um, but if we have a chance for it being livable for future generations, we've really got to stop new fossil fuel infrastructure. If those gas pipelines get in, that gas, all the forces of capitalism are going to keep that gas flowing, and it's just really bad. It's very easy. Go to mothersoutfront.org, and you'll find um, You'll find a, a, a section that says take action and you go in there and you can find ways to connect. Another great thing to do when you're on the website is sign up for the Mothers Out Front action alerts on a statewide basis when, um, when there are important bills in the state legislature or if we need to call Governor Baker to pressure him to um, help support the city of Weymouth in their fight against a new compressor station. Um, action alerts go out and they ask you, say, call Governor Baker and here's, here are some points you should make. And these calls really make a difference. A couple of years ago, I was researching all the new frack gas pipelines which gas companies and utilities wanted to bring to and through our state. And I began to notice some large facilities that were part of these pipeline projects called compressor stations. These st stations were situated every 30 to 100 miles along every major pipeline, and it sounded, from what I read, like they might be harmful to human health especially for nearby residents, as well as bad for the climate. There were stations proposed to the north of us in Windsor, in Northbridge, in Drake at Massachusetts, and another just over the New Hampshire border in New Ipswich, to the south in Weymouth, in Rehoboth. And then there was one being built in uh, Rhode Island, in Burrowville. And I noticed that it... Uh, that in each location there was not only a compressor station proposed and people organizing against it, but there was a certain pediatrician who had come <laughs> to help the affected communities understand something of the health risks they might be exposed to. Who is this caring, committed person, I wondered? Wouldn't it be wonderful for us mothers and others fighting for the health and safety of our children and for environmental justice? to have some alliance with this pediatrician who was doing the same. 
Well, I hopped on the red line down to Quincy to hear his next presentation and find out more. And now, a year or so later, it's been my great privilege to have had the opportunity to watch Dr. Norgard in action and to work with him. Seeing him, even in the midst of his own pediatric work in Dorchester and parenting, uh, to give of his time to organizers in Weymouth and Rehoboth and West Roxbury and far beyond. To do critical research on what is in the gas coming into Massachusetts, help impacted communities with air monitoring, submit testimony to key agencies, be a founder of mass health uh, care providers against frac gas, and to be on the board of a key community group, uh, FRACS, in Weymouth. And I'm sure that's just a beginning. Always kind, always patient, and deeply committed. Please welcome Dr. Curtis Norgard. Uh, so as Susan is being modest because I had no intention of being part of this uh, healthcare providers group. And it was only it was a little over an hour ago or a little over a year ago that Susan contacted me and she said, after this presentation she attended in Quincy said, you know, can you please join with us and help us organize this group of healthcare providers? So that's uh, to her great credit. Um, and so I, I certainly I want to echo um, what Susan and Carol said that um, really appreciate everybody coming tonight and to everybody involved with organizing the event. It is something, you know, this topic is one that um, for, for one reason or another I've had great interest in and have put a lot of time into. And I, for many reasons I do think it's important. Um, I'm going to talk about rethinking the narrative along the lines of what we've already started hearing about. And building on this idea that stories are important, I was asked to share a little bit about why I'm so interested in this topic. And I think for Mothers Out Front kind of audience, it's easy to understand that, you know, my son and his future is a huge part of this. Um, I would do it for him alone. Um, this is my grandfather. Uh, this is another reason why I'm doing this work. Um, he, in the course of his career, was exposed to asbestos, and he developed mesothelioma. And so, um, in, without a doubt, climate change is really important, but environmental health is also very important. And this is the last reason why uh, I'm doing this work. This is a, a Syrian child. He's a, a refugee, not surprisingly. And um, as a pediatrician, uh, I certainly have a strong conviction that all, chi uh, all children are equally important, um, whether they're in my community or not. And uh, it's relevant tonight because of this report that came out, this study came out in 2015 in one of the top science journals in the country that um, made the argument that climate change helped to drive the drought that was then, by some um, accounts, a contributing factor to the current Syrian conflict. So, you know, it, it is a bit abstract, but I do really think, you know, um, climate change is a global issue and it's really important to think about everybody who's going to be affected by that. So we're gonna talk about um, rethinking the narrative. And as we heard, um, there is a huge effort to develop a positive narrative around natural gas or frac gas. And that narrative has been going on for a long time, or people have been working on it for a very long time. And talking about this with um, some people who have been uh, living in New England longer than myself talked about you know, a similar campaign when oil came around, uh, how great it was to have oil in your home. Now, you know, this is uh, cook better with gas, dry better with gas, no smoke, All right, it's great. This is another narrative, this is a newer one, around a, a children's book um, where the character is this fracosaurus and teaching our children how wonderful fracking is and it, it's so great, the sun is smiling and even these rocks, and they're, they're so happy to be fracked, they're smiling too. <laughs> um, so I, uh, we're gonna start, uh, start the, the more challenging part of the talk. I mean, I'm a, 
I have some research background and you know, I went through medical school, I'm a pediatrician. I love data, I love numbers. Um, I could go on for hours of just showing you charts and studies and graphs, um, but I think it's, <laughs> the stories are important too. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about data, and, but I'm, I'm gonna try not to overload the audience. And what I wanna do is I wanna talk about health issues because that's the other narrative that um, a lot of us are, are thinking about and, and raise the question, is there a health narrative that's part of our growing reliance on fracked gas. And to do that, um, unfortunately, we don't have the opportunity to get into this, this first part of the natural gas industry. So this is the whole thing here. It's you know, an overview. So that there's, there's three steps in the natural gas industry. There's this production, so this fracking, processing of the gas, and this is what's happening in the Marcellus Shale, which includes a lot of Pennsylvania, Ohio, parts of New York, where there's fortunately no fracking, and West Virginia. Um, but what we have in New England are these transmission and uh, distribution segments of the natural gas industry. And uh, so that's the, the part we're not gonna talk about, but we'll talk about this. So um, this is where, when you hear about these big pipelines, uh, these are large interstate high pressure pipelines that move the gas from the Marcellus Shale where it's produced and processed into other parts of the country. So for us, they're moving it into New England. And once it gets to us, it's transferred from directly from that high pressure pipeline system into the smaller pipelines that run through our streets. So for people who work on uh, gas leaks, that's in this domain here, the distribution system. And I'm hoping that when we, we're gonna talk about this and some health issues, and I hope that's informative for people who work on gas leaks. And same thing for people who work on pipelines, we're gonna talk about some things that may be a cause for concern in the distribution system. So um, it's pretty ambitious for one night, but I want to touch on, if on even a superficial level, um, what I think are potential health, some health effects and a lot of potential health risks related to the natural gas industry. So as a starting point uh, for this first half of the talk, when we talk about pipelines, uh, this is our test case or our, or our poster child, this Spectra Algonquin pipeline. And you can see that it starts um, near where the gas is fracked and processed and it ships it across New Jersey and New York into New England. And from there, there are all these branches, the gas gets delivered out into different parts of New England before it gets transferred to those low pressure systems. And um, it has been in the news a lot, and, and, you know, be, and that's because it's undergoing a set of three expansions. Uh, the first one's done, this included the metering and regulating station in West Roxbury. Um, we're in the middle of this a review for this Atlantic Bridge, which would include the Weymouth Compressor Station. And then Access Northeast, in its initial plan, was a huge expansion that would have had a dramatic impact on the state. It's in a semi-limbo right now. The, um, the financing and the details of the plan are being revised. So that's the third one that could be coming down the pipeline towards us, literally. Um, so uh, partly because it is going through a lot of expansion, we have a little bit of information about um, what it means to, to ship gas, burn gas in a pipeline. And so that's some of the numbers we're gonna talk about are what we know from these expansions. So just as a reminder, uh, this is what these pipelines look like. These are not the ones in our streets, obviously. These are three to three and a half foot in diameter, and they require an easement that fragments ecosystems. Um, safety is a whole entirely separate issue that, um, again, because of time limitations, we can't get into, but it's very important. When you have to talk about people living in incineration zones, that's not trivial. And the other thing is uh, about the pipelines that's important to know is, you know, if you see this picture of a pipeline, you might think, oh yeah, you know, can imagine the inside is this a steel pipe. And you may say, well, this is shipping gas. So 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road, it's gonna look just the same because you're moving gas through a pipeline. In reality, this is what the pipeline looks like on the inside. These are all natural gas pipelines. And what's happening here is that they're being cleaned. And uh, the way that works is this squeegee-like device goes, gets put into the pipeline, and it's pushed through the pipeline, and it drives forward all of this 
garbage, gunk, this black powder. And so the question you may want to ask yourself, where does that come from, right? This is the gas that ends up in New England, that ends up in our homes. So why is there this stuff in the pipeline? It obviously wasn't there to begin with. It's only there because it has something to do with the gas. And as we'll see, some of the things that we know for certain are in natural gas are chemicals that can exist in either a gas state, a liquid state, or a solid state. So those things may enter the pipeline as a gas. Uh, to some degree, they get filtered out at different steps in the form of a liquid. Um, but there are still microscopic droplets and particles in the gas, and those things can precipitate out into this junk. This is a metering and regulating station. And this is a picture of one in New Bedford. And that is basically at the end of a branch towards the end of that big Algonquin pipeline. So the, the basic function, one of the basic functions of these facilities is that they transfer the gas from the high pressure system to the low pressure system. So if you followed the West Roxbury metering and regulating station at all, that's the same thing, but that facility was like at least twice as big as what we're seeing here. This is really the whole thing in um, New Bedford. And the reason this facility is important, at least in terms of what we're talking about tonight, is that um, there is a hazardous materials, hazardous waste report um, that describes the hazardous waste that came out of this facility. And again, you have to ask yourself, if you really had bought into the idea that natural gas is clean, um, you know, why is there hazardous waste being generated at this facility? Um, so this is the report. And I, um, so this is Algonquin Gas, it was from 2007, and here it says New Bedford, there we go. And the description, waste pipeline liquids with greater than 50 parts per million of PCBs. So um, this pipeline was built before PCBs were banned because they're so persistent and toxic. Uh, and so they're still hanging around the pipeline because they are so persistent. So that makes sense. But now look at what's in the waste. Right? Um, barium, which is not particularly harmful to human health, but you know, where did that come from? Almost certainly that came from the Marcellus Shale where there's a lot of barium. Made its way all the way out to New Bedford. They certainly didn't put barium in the pipeline to operate it. Uh, chromium, lead, mercury. Uh, these are quite toxic, heavy metals. And again, what are they doing at a metering and regulating station? Did they use these things to somehow operate the station or clean the station? Um, I think to really be certain, we'd have to have an engineer from the industry to answer that question. But we know from the chemistry that happens in the geology, in the formation of the Marcellus Shale, that it's entirely um, plausible, if not certain, that lead and mercury actually formed in the Marcellus Shale itself. And so, my working hypothesis is that these things actually, in one form or another, entered that pipeline back down near New Jersey and traveled in one state or another, uh, in one form or another, all the way into Massachusetts. And somewhere along that line, they precipitate out because uh, lead, you know, I think lead is a solid, but you know, lead used to be in our gasoline. And then it went up after you came out of your car, went out in the air, and that's why they decided, well, we better not put lead in the gasoline anymore because it's all ending up in the air and people are breathing it. So lead can either as a gas form or as part of microscopic aerosol particles can be in the air and could travel through the pipeline system. Um, this is another meeting and regulating station in Weymouth. So there's this, you know, the building, the pipe yard. You know, unfortunately, uh, the company that, Spectra, we're talking about Spectra, that, uh, they've actually been bought out by Enbridge, but I'm just going to refer to them as Spectra. And um, they knew there was a faulty valve at that facility. Um, they had known it for months. It was an emergency release valve, and they neglected to repair it. And so in early January, a relief valve froze open at that facility. And over the course of about two hours, uh, there were over 200,000 cubic feet of gas released from that facility. So I think that kind of event is important for us to keep in mind. Um, if you look at a map um, that predicted where that gas went um, using tools from the no National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, based on the weather, that gas should have gone down here, which is pretty much where people were smelling it. 
And if uh, natural gas is entirely benign and does not have any harmful things in it, maybe this is not a big deal. But as we'll see tonight, that is not the case. And so this huge gas release um, exposed people to things that are harmful to their health. Um, so even what might seem like a, a metering and regulating station, before West Roxbury, who'd ever heard of that, right? Nobody. Like, these are everywhere. They're all over the state. Because any time you get gas off of that big pipeline, it has to go through one of those facilities. And if they're not operated well, they can leak gas. And they certainly um, release some smaller amounts of pollution by, um, you know, burning heaters and, and generators at the site. Um, but there's very little information known about them. We do know more about these compressor stations, and part of the reason is that they are uh, usually classified as a minor source of air pollution, if not a major source, and so when they're built, the company building them has to release a certain amount of information where they predict uh, the facility will release X tons of pollution a year, and so on and so on. Um, so that's one of the reasons why Compressor stations are important to give us some lessons about what it means to be burning gas. This is a pretty representative s picture. There's a pipe yard, there's a building, and the compressor engine itself is in this building. But, you know, we're missing a couple of things here. So there are usually some storage tanks at the site for storing waste or fuels. Um, but also, if you look into the background, there's nothing there, right? This is like in Colorado or something. And you can see out to the mountains, there's nothing. And this is just not the case in the Northeast. Um, these facilities are usually in or situated very close to a community. And in the case of something like the West Roxbury Metering and Regulating Station, even if that facility generates minimal pollution, is literally right next to someone's house. So you could put a facility like this in the middle of nowhere, and there may be minimal impact on human health. But now you put this in Weymouth, and surrounded by three different residential neighborhoods, and it's a completely different story if you want to talk about human health. This is what the, a compressor engine actually looks like. This is the type of engine that's being planned and installed in the Northeast. Um, it's a um, centrifugal engine. So there's an engine that looks like a jet engine, actually. You know, if you just look at that and it's going around. These things are burning that fuel, they're spinning around, and they're transferring that force to a turbine that generates high pressures and compression. And that's um, what is pushing the gas along the pipeline. So these have to be set up every, you know, between 20 and 100 miles. Um, and they're mo in almost all cases, they're siphoning off a little bit of the gas from the pipeline and burning it in this engine. And that's where some of the pollution comes from. So um, with that description about the facility, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the the type of data that we're going to look at for the rest of the evening. Um, I think the in the end, we care about the quality of the environment, but you know, if we're talking about health as an issue related to natural gas, what we what we are concerned about is human health. And so the kind of information we would really want to have is, you know, large public health studies, um, many studies looking at the relationship between health outcomes and um, pollution from these facilities or people living in close proximity to them, and those data simply do not exist. And so uh, there is some effort being made to develop those kind of data, but they're not going to be out um, for any time in the near future. So this public health, great data, but we don't have them. So there's a little bit of information about pipelines, one or two studies, literally one or two that I've been able to find that look at, you know, do people living near these facilities complain about have health problems, right? So there's, we'll look at those. But I, you know, I, I want to bring up this whole topic because we're going to look at a lot of pollution numbers. And this is where, um, if we're going to talk about health in relation to the natural gas industry, we can talk a little bit, I mean, there's just almost no information about health, directly looking at health effects. That being said, we know a lot about pollution. And we know something about the pollution coming out of these facilities. So we can put two and two together, and that's the kind of conversation we're going to have. There's some things that we know quite well in terms of how much pollution will come from them, um, some things that are more uncertain, and some things that I think are uh, questions of concern that we need to think about. So this here um, 
is almost as an aside because there's so little information on it. This was the results from a study that was just health surveys of people who lived within a mile of a compressor station. And 63% uh, of the people surveyed, there was 35 people, 63% of them reported having uh, respiratory symptoms or nosebleeds, so involving the respiratory tract. 34% headaches, 29% rash. So there are a couple of things to point out about this. Um, the first is, this is, these are not the data where you, that you use to make the strong argument. The compressor station is causing these health effects. There's a relationship, and it gives you a starting point to, for thinking about what kind of studies you might do next. And these are all symptoms that are plausible. We know these are symptoms that you get from being exposed to air pollution. Um, but I think it's also worth noting, 63% of people reported these. I mean, even if you think about like winter time here, uh, your kids are getting more nosebleeds. If you have asthma, you have more asthma symptoms. But if 63% is like two thirds of people having those symptoms. So it does, I think, raise an important issue that this may be important um, for future work. So that's the known health effects for pipelines. <laughs> that's it. That's not a great way to understand the material. So I like this better. Um, if we start with our compressor engine, there's noise pollution, um, which is, a, again, a separate topic, which is important. But you know, the air pollution is a, a complex topic that um, we know more about. So you can break down those categories of pollution by talking about what comes from burning gas and uh, what happens if you just release gas into the air, because that happens, it happens at compressor stations. And then what if you, um, there's another category of things that I consider non-combustible. So um, if you vent the gas or you burn it, those things aren't going to come out either way. So this is just reorganizing the information that we already knew about, uh, nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, and so on. And methane itself is not toxic, but it's such a potent driver of climate change, it deserves special mention. And then gas itself, if you vent it directly, it includes meth um, volatile organic compounds and hazardous air pollutants. Uh, even if you don't burn it it's, and you release it, it's in gas. And again, this is based on industry documents. Those things are in gas. And then non-combustible, for sure the radon is there, um, and possibly these things as well. And each of these categories of pollutants are officially categorized as toxic and or cancer-causing. So... Um, what we would really like to do, be able to do with this information is um, say, well, you're going to have X tons coming out. Um, is that enough to be of concern, right? Because again, that's ultimately we want to know about our health. That's the topic for tonight. And there are standards for air pollution that are meant to protect our health. Um, they may not always do that. Um, but we, um, in a lot of these cases, we don't have the information we need to make that kind of assessment. And so uh, we can't tonight have a, a really detailed discussion about that because what we really need is a health impact assessment for a facility like this, which uh, is conducted by a panel of experts um, and is able to go into great detail and evaluate this information. But if we just do kind of a casual, you know, like let's get some sense of how important this pollution is. Um, if we go to a major um, database of health studies um, from PubMed.gov and you just search particulate matter, because again, that comes out of burning gas in compressor stations, power plants, and so on. If you search that plus stroke, 239 studies, particulate matter in cardiovascular, so like heart disease, over 2,000 studies, particulate matter, 1,000 oh, studies with asthma, another toxic air pollutant, um, nitrogen dioxide and asthma, card cardiovascular, there are hundreds of studies. So this is just to point out that, you know, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about each of those individual pollutants, but I just want to make the point that um, there's a lot of general research being done looking at the relationship between those major air pollutants and health. And so, um, if the compressor station releases those things, we know that there's going to be an effect on health. And in fact, it's a lot more than just, you know, air pollution, you think it's going to asthma, right? I think that would be the most common thing. But there are a surprising number of health outcomes associated with air pollution. This is just a handful of studies that I looked at, and I created this tabulation, this table. So if you get looking only at particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide, 
you know, those things have been associated with the diagnosis of asthma, diagnosis of autism. This was from the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, but once you are sick with a disease, these pollutants make it more likely that you go, have to go to clinic, even conditions that you might not think are related to air pollution, like diabetes. This is, uh, there's a pretty reliable relationship between air pollution and diabetes. Um, and if you've got something like asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, more air pollution means you're more likely to be hospitalized. And the same thing, um, it's more likely, if there's more air pollution, you're more likely to die from any number of conditions as a consequence of more air pollution. So this just brings me back to the same point. Um, we can try and put numbers onto this, and I've tried to do that, but that is really, to do that accurately is really um, quite an undertaking. Uh, but I do think it's informative to say, you know, this is what you get from burning gas. You get pollution that has these health effects. And what, in the absence of a health impact assessment, it really is, to some degree, um, I think, uh, totally up for question, are these the kind of things that we're going to see? And I really do think from reading these public health studies and looking at how much pollution comes from compressor stations, I do think it's very, especially if you look at how close some of these are being placed to communities, I really think we're going to see uh, cases of you know, COPD attacks, asthma attacks, heart attacks. And you know, what does it mean you live in this community? We, you can talk, we can talk in the abstract about the numbers. And you know, I love to think about and talk about the numbers. You say like 5% uh, increase in the risk of an asthma attack. And then that community, there's X number of kids have asthma. That means two more asthma attacks in kids for the next year. But these are really like people in your community, right? If you live in somewhere like Weymouth, these are your neighbors. And so, you know, having another asthma attack, heart attack, that is really means something in your community. Through a lot of work, we can say that there are no health risks associated with burning gas in your home. So can relax, we're almost done for the night. How can I be so confident? I have a great source. And that source is the natural gas industry, right? <laughs> it's clean, no problem. Get it, you've gotta get it. And you know, like um, my family, we're trying to, to, we're looking for a home. And they said, every house you go in, if it's got oil, the agent is like bending over backwards to say, oh yeah, but it'd be so easy to get gas in this house. No problem, you can get it. Um, and people are asking, is there gas in the house? Is there gas on the street that we could hook up to a gas pipeline? This is just out there, this is what people are saying. Um, so if we go back to our compressor station, air pollution, all these nasty things that are coming out, they're toxic, they cause cancer. You know, this is what you get from burning gas in a compressor station, right? Is it even possible there are any parallels to burning gas in your home? Is it possible that when you burn gas inside in a burner instead of in a compressor engine, is it, could you possibly creating these things in your home? Well, at least some of them are being created in our homes when we burn gas in the house. And this goes back to what we started the, the night with, with Carol saying that amazing letter, um, we are being sold a narrative. And that narrative is that gas is great. And if you get into the science of it and peer reviewed studies, that is not necessarily the case. And so if we wanna develop a narrative, if we think there's a reason to be concerned about health and we want to develop that narrative, this is some of the information we have to start getting at because all these people around here, they want to get off of oil, and I'm not saying oil's great, I think we should get off of oil, but not onto gas. Um, and until we change that perspective, we're going to keep driving up the demand. And when these pipelines go in, the state reviews them and says, well, can you prove to us that there's enough need for your new major pipeline with its compressor station, all those other things, and cutting through conservation areas? And um, if we turn this around and say, no, you know, we're, we've got enough gas, we don't want any more, we're going to do energy efficiency, um, renewables and so on and so on, that we're not going to need more gas and that's going to eliminate the need for more pipelines and more fracking. So, so this is um, just a couple of examples of the kind of research that's done to show that you know, burning gas in your house may not be a great idea. Um, this is a freely available study looking at uh, a pollutant nitrogen dioxide. It's toxic. Um, it is associated with respiratory disease and heart disease um, and neurologic disease. So in this study, the researchers went into some homes. Um, there, I have to say that I think the sample sizes and the study design were not um, 
perfect. So there's this is their baseline condition, which um, doesn't quite match up with the other conditions. But for what they wanted, these scientists want to do is ask the question: If we go into homes where natural gas, there are natural gas burning appliances, and we try and come up with different interventions uh, to try and improve the air quality, what happens? So the, this is the baseline measurements of this pollutant, 19, and here they didn't even bother putting it in. Um, this is a ventilation hood, right? So this is what most people have over your stove. It's just this thing that's blowing air around. It doesn't really do much. Um, and the comparison conditions are an air purifier and stove replacement. So if you have an air purifier, after a week, you know, the, there was a significant decrease in the amount of nitrogen dioxide in the home. Now you put it three months, there's still a significant difference there. But what happens if you take out the gas stove and you simply replace it with an electric one? You get an even better decrease. So it goes 19 down to 11 and then 10. So it's about a 50% reduction over the course of three months. Right? And this is where, because we have a lot to talk about, we can't go into great detail, but you remember that slide. This, this is associated with respiratory disease, heart disease, neurologic disease. Take your gas stove out, and that went down by half. Right? This is the kind of information, like, nobody talks about this. This is out there. You, anyone can go download this. It's freely available. Um, and it's not just the air pollution. It's also health outcomes. Um, and these are, you know, we're talking on the order of not hundreds or thousands of studies doing this kind of work, but dozens of studies. And there is a pretty reliable direction that these studies all go in, that uh, burning gas in your house has a negative effect on air quality and health outcomes. So this is not looking at gas versus no gas, but looking at if you've got gas and you do a better job of ventilating it out of the house. You know, what is the chance of a child in your home getting asthma? Um, so did you ventilate it? Yes, no. No is the baseline case, and that's considered the odds are 1 or 100%. Now, did you ventilate the gas stove? Yes. And these are where they, they found all of this. Is, this is the kind of large study that I was talking about, right? These are like 5,000. There were 5,000 asthma cases in the study, and then there were hundreds of cases where there was a gas stove, and then they split those up. Um, and for people who ventilated their gas stove, they went back and looked at the risk of the children in that house having asthma. And the risk was 64% relative to if you didn't ventilate the gas. And so this is one study, um, may not be a perfect study, but this is not the only one. This is just an example to point out the fact that um, whether you look at indoor air quality or health outcomes, you burn gas in your home and the majority of those studies all say it's worse. Benzene causes cancer. This is just scientific panels, federal agencies have determined benzene causes cancer. And what it does is it causes leukemia. It's really effective, it's very reactive with the human body, and so um, if a, this is the threshold that's been set for benzene, 0 0.03 parts per billion. And what that means, that number means is, um, if you breathe in 30, um, parts per trillion, or this 0 0.03 parts per billion, 30 parts per trillion of benzene over the course of your lifetime, we think that is enough to increase the risk of cancer, in this case, leukemia. And that risk is on the order, is very low, on the order of one in a million. But um, I have to, at this point, inform you all to my great regret, as soon as we leave this building, we will be breathing benzene. And I know that because the state tells me. Their state is actually monitoring, Massachusetts is monitoring this. Uh, these are data going back, it's kind of hard to see, but going back 20 years. Uh, every year the state is measuring the amount of benzene in the air. And 20 years ago, it used to be higher, maybe on the order of, this is, we're talking about 0.3 parts per billion. But remember the threshold, that safety threshold, the state uses the same as the federal. Massachusetts, we use the same as the federal, 0.03. So we're maybe 10, 10 times um, above, 10 times higher than that um, safety limit here. You know, one thing you can notice, there's a, these different colors are different toxic pollutants. And the overall trend is these are going down, which is good. It's definitely a good thing. And part of that has to do with benzene coming out of, like, less, there have been things done to remove benzene out of gasoline, which is important. Um, 
And the, the less we burn fuels of any kind, the less benzene there will be in the air. Um, but the, um, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up is to point out the fact that uh, it's my observation that people interpret these numbers differently. So one interpretation, I mean, it's, simple, it's just a matter of fact. The amount of benzene in the air around Boston exceeds what's considered a safe limit. Um, some people will look at this and say, well, there's maybe, if you say a million people exposed to that amount of benzene, if it, you know, back in 1995, um, people who had been breathing that for a long time, their risk of, you know, those million people, there may have been 10 cases of leukemia caused by breathing this benzene in the air. So that's kind of one view. You may think, well, I don't, I don't agree with any leukemia, extra leukemia because of the fossil fuel industry and so on. Other people may say, well, you know, Walking across the street can kill you, and so 10 out of a million doesn't sound too bad. Um, there are standards, and we all make our own decisions about this. But the, the thing that I do think we could all agree on, we're already above what's considered safe. Do we really want more benzene in the air? Right? Do we, shouldn't we be trying to get this number down? And this is something that industry, when they go and talk to communities, um, they never say anything about benzene in the gas. And this is rarely something that's part of the discussion. And again, another place where you know, um, we, we haven't done the health assessment or the research to really answer the question, is this a problem or not? It might be a problem, might not. I mean, I think we can say people generally seem to agree we don't want more benzene in the air. Um, uh, this study, I think, is really important to point out that it's not just the gas in the, the big pipelines. Uh, this is a study where the, the, from the National Institutes of Standard and Technology, and those scientists took samples of gas, and they said, well, let's try and find all these different kind of complex organic molecules and see how many we can find with some advanced technique. These are all the things they found. So this is when I refer to gas as a complex mixture. If we only look at the organic compounds detected by this method, there's a lot of them there. And some of them, again, benzene is one of them. With their improved method, there was quite a bit. They were easily, it was easily detected. Hexane is also toxic. It's a neurotoxin. Um, there's quite, relatively speaking, more of it in gas than benzene. So the, the point of that is to say, you know, they got that gas sample from um, basically the, the end of the pipeline system, these low pressure pipes that bring the gas to our houses, right? They went to that sort of system. They didn't get their gas from the high pressure pipeline. Because you may say, well, from going to the high pressure to the low pressure, maybe things changed some, and it didn't change. They still found this benzene at the very end of the system. So this um, is from a different part of the country. You could argue, well, maybe the gas here is not like the gas there, but at some point, I think we just have to admit to the fact that there's benzene in the gas here. And this is where, you know, coming into the gas leaks. So what is this gas that's coming out? What is in that gas? Well, I can't tell you everything. Pretty sure there's benzene in it. That's for starters. Um, and, you know, focusing on benzene, you know, part of the reason to do that is because we know a lot about benzene. But there are other things like I said, hexane in uh, toluene, xylene, those things are also in the gas. Those things are toxic. Uh, those things are coming out here and all over the place. So this is, you know, I want to give a, a shout out to the people who are working on gas leaks. This is important. <laughs> um, kind of regardless of your perspective, I think we should all be able to agree that, you know, not having this stuff, whether you talk about methane and climate change or these hazardous pollutants, let's stop this. And so it's great to hear that. So the last, you know, take a last few minutes to talk about one other story. Um, it's a relatively new story for me, but again, one that I think raises important questions and um, really points to a lack of data, which makes me um, feel unsure and uncertain. And this gets to the point, going back to this asbestos, the coal dust. You know, at one point, these things were all thought it was not a problem, right? And then at some point, people in the know knew it was a problem, it's like cigarettes, right? At some point, somebody knew and didn't say anything, and nothing was done, and then we found out decades later there's a problem. So this is kind of the, the where I would put this information. Radon, pretty serious stuff, uh, may or may not be a problem, but I don't think we know enough to know the answer to that. Is it a problem or not? So what I'm going to show is some actual data from a report that was prepared by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. And with all the fracking happening there, I said, well, let's figure out, is radiation a problem when it comes to our natural gas industry, right? 
So I think if you want to talk about people being excited about having gas in their homes, well, let's make sure you know about radiation and the natural gas industry. So this first table is looking at the uh, radium in uh, fracking wells. Uh, how did the radon get there? It got there the same way that radon gets into our homes over long geologic time. I mean, uranium is in all kinds of the bedrock, right? And so we know that in New England, there's um, radon is in the bedrock, and it's because there's uranium that breaks down into radium, which is what's being measured here, and that breaks down into radon. So um, this, we're looking at conventional wells, gas wells. So you just drill down to get the gas. There were four of these. The average of the radium was 336 picocuries per liter. They compare that to the unconventional, which just means fracked. Now you go down into a shale formation and you frack it, and you know what comes out of the drilling water that's used to drill these wells? It was like almost 30 times the amount of radium coming out from a fracked well. And I, you know, almost one of the reasons to bring this up is because a lot of people, I think, want to know what's the difference between a, a regular gas and fracked gas, right? And so uh, here's one thing, more radium comes out when you frack a well compared to when you just drill a conventional well. And why is that important? Because uh, radium breaks down to radon, as I said. Radium is, um, dissolves in water. So this is a, radium is a huge problem, um, well, a huge, poses a huge potential hazard where fracking happens, so in Pennsylvania. It's readily detected in streams there. Um, but for us, we think more about radon. Radon is a gas. Um, it doesn't dissolve in water. And this is from that same report. They're looking at how much radon is in the gas coming out of the well. So this is right at the fracking well. So you know, these, you know, some of them are one or four. I mean, the, the, we're supposed to be have this number as low as possible. The official limit is supposed to be four picocuries of radon. Um, maybe under two is better than under four. Um, but some of them are a little bit higher. And you might still say, well, it's a 70-something, 80, 30. The half-life, how long does radon hang around for? The half-life of radon is just under four days. So uh, some agencies and, and independent individuals have looked at this kind of information, and there's some other measurements that you could use for this, and said, well, uh, radon's coming out with the methane, the, the natural gas. Is it a problem? Are we looking at radon coming out of people's stoves? And the opinion of these assessments is yes, radon is going into people's homes. Is there enough to be a problem to increase the radon beyond an acceptable level? And in those few assessments that have been done, there's a, a conflicting results. So some say yes, some say no. So myself, this is not my area of expertise. I can't comment one way or another except to point that out. Another thing I want to point out, though, when we talk about the half-life of radon, which these assessments do, they say, well, if the radon falls down enough to a low enough level, then it's, then it's fine. We're OK. Um, I haven't seen a single one of these assessments or a single one of these uh, filings for pipelines that talk about this, which is basic science. Uh, this is radium decay chain. And the, we're missing the uranium step up here. So the uranium goes to the radium. Radium goes to radon. And then radon has this 3.8 day half-life, goes through a couple of quick decays, lasting minutes, um, and you end up down this chain to lead, which has a half-life of 22 years. Uh, so these things, uh, radon is only a gas. These things um, are likely to precipitate out. So you remember the crud in that pipeline? Um, gas has um, ultrafine particles in it. It's getting filtered at metering and regulating stations like in West Roxbury. Um, and what's in those droplets and particles? They don't all get filtered. Some of them go right into our homes. And well, which of these things is it? Uh, this is where I can't tell you. And in, in the end, it would just be lead. That'd be great because Lead, this, this form of lead is not radioactive. It's simply a potent neurotoxin for children's nervous systems. It simply causes kidney failure. So not a problem, right? If it goes down to here, this is where, why did these assessments all stop here? So um, 
some of the big picture health issues. Uh, I don't think we covered any of them except maybe benzene and radon <laughs> radiation to any great depth. But really, we didn't. That was not the purpose of tonight. Is was not to look at a compressor station and give you everything to know about a compressor station because there's a lot. But to talk about pipelines, and once that gas gets into our city, you know, is there some cause for concern? Is there a basis for developing a health concern story to counter this narrative? And this is what I know up to this point. I'll leave it to you to make your own decision. Should we be worried about this or not? Is it useful to have this kind of conversation or not? Um, but to, in summary, is gas clean if it's burned? Well, it is burned at compressor stations, meeting regulating stations in our homes. When you're cooking over your gas stove, where are those emissions going? Into your face. So um, <laughs> there is a difference. It is not a good difference. OK, and, and when you burn gas, this is my personal perspective from looking at these numbers of, and looking at air pollution. It, when you burn it anywhere, it releases major air pollutants. And we saw that actually is happening in homes too, right? Burning the gas, that's one whole set of questions. You leak the gas, you're getting all the stuff that's in the gas before it's burned. Gas is leaked and vented at compressor stations, meeting regulating stations like we saw for the one in Weymouth. Probably going to be happening in West Roxbury, right next to people's homes. Gas leaks from distribution pipelines in their streets. Like, I, I think everybody in Mothers Out Front is well aware of that. Um, but it also leaks in some people's homes. And this is, I don't have data to talk about that, but anecdotally, you know, talk to people, either yourself if you have gas in your home or people you know. Do you ever have like a, a low gas leak and somebody comes over and says, do you smell that? You have gas in your house. Like I've noticed it. I, my friends have noticed that. Um, and certainly like it does leak in our houses. We have to get that fixed from time to time. So if you leak the gas anywhere, you get toxic and carcinogenic hazardous air pollutants, radon, maybe others, maybe some heavy metals. And so the, you know, again, kind of going back to what um, we want to know the health story. We don't, we may want to know the pollution story, but we really want to know the health story. I've alluded to the fact that we don't have most of the health information that we need, but how are we going to get there? Um, one tool, I mean, we could do more research. I certainly hope that's going to happen, that we get more solid data. But another approach is a health impact assessment. And this is a, an established form of assessment that includes some standards on how this should be done. And um, Representative Ed Coppinger's office, who represents West Roxbury, um, they drafted a bill with the support of this, our organization, which would help to revise the requirements for new energy facilities. So that means pipelines, all kinds of power plants, liquefied natural gas facilities, compressor stations, they would need to have a health impact assessment as part of their review.